Hey everyone, so I've been a bit quiet on the video front on YouTube at the moment just because I've been getting ready for my newborn son to arrive in around four to five weeks. And also alongside that, I've been rejigging my studio around and also my live rig has completely changed from a doorless rig into a hybrid setup. Now I know it looks doorless still, apart from obviously I've got some MIDI controllers and Ableton will run in the background, but I decided to go hybrid for numerous reasons which i'm going to explain in this video and also show you some cool features that we can do with a hybrid setup so this is an introduction to a long series of videos that will cover all of the moving parts of this new setup and also i will develop the live rig and the live set as we do these videos so this is going to be like a free course series on youtube as well as the the paid courses that i do on my website jamesorvis.com so there'll be a lot of value in these videos and if you already have a live rig or creating a live rig you can use a lot of the methods that I'm showcasing in these videos in your own live rigs. So first of all, why have I gone back to using Ableton in a live setting? So I was quite reluctant to do this, but Ableton 12 came out and as you know from our previous videos, I got really obsessed with using Ableton's new distortion plugin RAW. And I was like, this sounds exactly like the distortion sounds I've been trying to get out of analog pedals mainly because of the modulation capabilities and also the option to feedback the sound back into RAW to get feedback overtones. And it quickly become a big part of my latest productions. And then I was like, how can I do that live? So hybrid seemed like the way to go. Now I was reluctant because I thought I've tried using Ableton many times in the past because I've been doing this for almost 15 years now. And I've gone from Ableton set to kind of Ableton using synthesizers alongside it. Then Ableton and Electron boxes, but using the sequences and syncing it to Ableton. And then going completely doorless. Then going doorless with loads of analog pedals and stuff, which you saw in my last setup. And now coming to this place where it's come full circle and I'm like, I'm going to keep it as doorless as I can, but then run Ableton in the background. So a little backstory, I was like chatting to a few different people who have recently gone hybrid. And one of them that stands out was Chenk Salini, who is also a data line. I chatted with him on Instagram. And as you know, he used to work quite closely with Electron. And he's kind of, to me, he's the face of Electron. He, he always has been the face of Electron for me. And he was always pushing the envelope with Electron boxes. So when I saw that Chenk was going hybrid, I was like, I need to talk to him again because I want to know why he's done that because he is like doorless guy. So I chatted to him and there were some really good points that he made. One thing that I didn't like though was going back to that way of scrolling through an Ableton set with the scenes. I was like, I can't do that. I love the way that I've been working using the Electron boxes in a live setting. It's got some caveats and some, some pitfalls that I have managed to fix using boxes like the Pirate MIDI Bridge 6, which we're going to come on to. Um, yeah, let's just get stuck into it, right? Because there's loads to talk about. And what I'm going to do is talk about issues and problems and how I fixed it using Ableton, using these devices. And I'll cover it all briefly, but we won't go massively in depth to the programming. That will come each week as we go through the audio routine, the MIDI routine, what this does on a deeper level and how to set it up, um, how I'm rooting everything into Ableton. But I'll give you a brief overview and some demonstrations. And I'll show you how it works. I'm really excited about this. I think it's brilliant. I think the way it works is absolutely amazing. It's fixed a lot of issues for me as well. So let's just quickly talk about why I'm using Ableton and how Ableton becomes a bit of a processor for the live rig. So if we jump over to Ableton, you can see that I've got in Ableton, I've got Syntact and Digitact. All of these audios are all coming in through the Moto 16A. And as you can see, they're analog inputs. We've got aux track left and right. Octatrack Q, left and right. So the Q I'll come on to in a second. This is for using these two as Deck A and Deck B, like two CDJs. I'll come on to that later. 
Then we've got Digitat left and right, Syntax left and right, Typhon left and right, Hydrosynth left and right, and the MAM MB33. And even after all that, with the Moto 16 I've still got three analog ins available because it's got 16 ins and 16 outs. Plus, you can expand that with more boxes, but this is plenty for me, and I've still got another three slots there if I need them. The output settings, this is where it gets quite cool with the ins and outs going through Ableton. And those of you that have tried this stuff are probably thinking, what about latency? What about all these other things? But we'll come on to that because I've fixed a lot of issues there as well. So you can see here, we've got main outputs left and right. At the moment, they're going to my speakers. In a live setting, they would go to front of house. Then we've got um, phones, which is headphones. This is enables me to queue out deck B and deck A. I'll come on to that later, so like a DJ set, basically. And then we've got um, drums left and right, which is the drum bus from Ableton. So let's go back to Ableton. Syntax Digitac comes in here, gets rooted to a drum bus. Drum bus goes out and drum bus goes back into the octa track on inputs A and B. Then we've got synths which is the Typhon, the MAM, the Hydra, all going into a bus. And then that bus comes back out of the synth bus and goes into Octatrack C and D. As we go through the series, I'll do a proper diagram that you can download from my Patreon. And then you can see here, Syntax inputs left and right. That's the, the inputs on the Syntax because what I wanted to be able to do was send fins into the Syntax and mainly send the Digitat into the syntax so that i have the option to either route this into ableton or i can send it into the syntax to blend with the syntax and push into its effects bus there's a lot of different routings and things that i can do on the fly and a lot of it can be automated with max for live and again we'll come on to that there's a lot to talk about it's going to be very inspiring for you guys why is the reason that i routed all of the audio into ableton back out again and back in again and then out to front of house. The reason for it was I wanted to up my processing game so that what I make in the studio is what I'll be able to play live as well. Quite a lofty goal and it's been quite hard in the past to achieve that. With a hybrid setup in the past, I managed to do it with EQs and compression and saturation, all this kind of stuff, but latency was a big issue. And then with the dollar setup, it started to get very expensive because I was buying um, pedals like the Source Audio EQ2. Then I realized I need one for that, one for that, one for that. It would have cost me thousands and a lot of weight and a lot of room as well. So I feel like this is a, a much better way of doing it. And what I've done is you can see if we go to the Digitact, you can see audio comes in, it goes into the raw um ignore the tuner and then we've got some other stuff as well like a second raw because you always need two right and then we've got um eq so i'm using pro q3 and then that's just going out so it's quite simple at the moment i can um increase this complexity if i want to but then the idea is that both of these have got very similar um parameters sorry very similar effects going on to process both of those and then they both go into a drum bus at the moment what i'm using is just standard clip um and this allows me to get the sound really loud so if i press play on this now so you can see getting a really healthy like output going on there um and also let's just have a listen to that digitax let's just turn these off let's listen to this digitax without any processing so Turn raw off. Raw 2, listen to that. Let me just turn up my headphones a bit. Really clean. That's how it would normally sound going into the Ox track. But then with the raw. So that's that's the first reason. It enables me to really boost my sound. This is the kind of processing I would do in the studio, and I wanted to do that live. The other cool thing with raw is that I'm also able to manipulate the settings on here using um, a MIDI track on the Digitats. Now we'll come into that later on as we go through these different um, videos because it's gonna get very lengthy if I cover everything in great detail. But the idea is that on these tracks, um, it's been a week since I played around with this. So let me just have a look. Yeah, like see here, value one. If I move that, nothing happens. So let me just go to this one. Is it there? Yeah, there we go. So channel 15, I need to work these out and label them, but you can see it's moving there, yeah? The idea is that I wanted to be able to 
go into these tracks and sequence um, movement. So if I go to pattern five, you can see some movement going on the cutoff there. And also increasing and decreasing the feedback amount. If we go back to number one. So you can see there increases and decreases that. And I've done some other tests as well where I got pretty experimental with this and I had all of these kind of moving around. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I could do there. And the idea was that I was going to buy an analog heat and put an analog heat next to the Digitax and the Syntax and then try and sequence the parameters in the heat using MIDI tracks. As cool as that would be, it still doesn't give me all of this flexibility that you get with Ableton's RAW. Now, the other cool thing with doing this stuff is that you can see I've made presets. Now, the presets within the tracks, they are just so that I can store the settings. So if I click on these now, you'll see the settings change, right? So they're songs. These are songs that I've tried making um, recently just for this kind of demonstration. And then they are just basically references so that I can make sure that I'm backing up all of the settings for the tracks. Um, but how this changes on a global level is if we go to presets track here that I've made, you can see I've got two, two clips here and you can see they've got songs there. Um, and this is a pack. Let me just have a look. Which one is it? Performance pack by if there. Yes, it's this one here. And I'm using the variations uh, Max for Live device. And what I can do with this is I can store and reload on the fly, like you would with an Electron device, but also I can do it per sun. So when the sun changes, this automatically changes. Now it's getting a bit intense, I know, but what happens is I send a signal from a MIDI channel on the Digitact. So if I see this one here where it says, uh, fuck it up, right? So that one there, you can see when I press play, it triggers the play button, right? And if I go to pattern one, you can see it triggers that first one. Let me show you how this works in context, right? So, so you can see we've triggered that one there. And then if I go to pattern five, you can see it's triggered this here now, this uh, fuck it up. And that changes all of the settings, not just on the Digitats or the Syntax, but it also changes it on all of the global settings in Ableton, unless I have told the uh, Max for Live device that I don't want to include them in the changes. So you can see these are my exclusions here. So things like the deck A and deck B settings, they are excluded from this. So that fixed a lot of issues where in the past they used to run like an empty MIDI clip and then I would automate the settings to change as I go through the set. Whereas with this, what I could do is just basically store it. Um, all you got to do is stash it and then you basically label it. Then you create a MIDI clip and then you rename that MIDI clip exactly the same as what it says within this list here very simple stuff i've battle tested it it works really really well i was worried that it would kind of crash and mess up ableton but it's been absolutely solid for weeks and um, not had any problems with it so yeah that's that's one aspect of it of many aspects as we go through this um let's also take a look at some of the other stuff as well so that's one thing, so I can change all of the settings as I go through the set. The other thing with the uh, Max for Live device is if I'm playing something like this. Now let's move over to the MIDI Fighter Twister. And actually what I'll do is, before I get ahead of myself, we'll just talk about the MIDI Fighter Twister and why I've got this here. So this does multiple different things. It acts as a DJ mixer. So... You can see here I've set up uh, a DJ mixer and I'll go through this in the video as well. So I've got a DGM style filter. This is deck here. I've also got take out the lows, put the lows in. And you can click them to reset them. Mids, highs. What I can also do is sends. So this is deck here. Um, delay, delay time, delay feedback. And if I click that, it turns it into time delay. So it's synced. So this has enabled me. This has enabled me to get rid of 
the um, Source Audio Collider, which I absolutely love, but it's gone off the pedal board now. This just does it for me. That's all I needed. Um, so yeah, reverb, delay, reset them like that. And then same on Deck B as well. We'll come on to Deck B in a second. The reason why I wanted to quickly explain this is the um, the call and reload idea. So what I can do is I can set the um, stashes and the recalls for each of the tracks in the set, but I can also do it on the fly like you would on an Electron device. On an Electron device, you can basically save a pattern and then reload it. On this, if I save that by pressing this top button, so if I press that and look at Ableton, you can see we've got stash. That means it's saved this setting. Now let's just change a load of things. Take out the lows, put in some highs. And then if I press reload, which is this one, watch. It recalls the state, but it's not just for the DJM settings, the mixer settings. It's also for all of the other parameters in the set as well. I could go wild with the settings on, um, let's just do it actually, let's just, I'll show you how to do it. So if I go like this, and we've stashed that already, but then I start to move all these around. So I've completely changed that up now. Let's go reload. And then we're back to where it was. So that gives me the ability to go a little bit off piste with the set. So there's a lot to get through, but next I want to talk about deck A and deck B. And then we'll come back to some of the other stuff like the Sims and how I'm rooting stuff. So you can see here we've got deck A, which we've just talked about. If I bring this knob down here, I can turn the volume up and down. Now I'm thinking about changing this into some sort of crossfader which might be easier, but you can see we've also got deck B as well. Now, how deck B works is, let's say if we are wanting to exit a track. So let's say if we take out some stuff like this, and then we click yes to arm all. What that's going to do is it's going to create a loop on track eight. Now I'm not gonna go deeply into how this works, but this is a trick that I used to do previously. On track eight, I've got a looper which records all of the sound coming in on the master. And then what I can do is if I just turn deck A down and bring deck B up, that loop is now playing on this channel here. I need to fix this, but that needs to turn it up a little bit. Um, so that's playing on there and I can obviously affect it and I can um, play with the filters and everything and the delay still. And while that's doing that, I can then switch to a new track like this. So I've changed the pattern now, or not yet. Now I've changed the pattern, but this is still playing, right? Let me just turn the blazer and reverbs down a bit. Let's just see if this is wet. So I'm not sure if this is gonna mix well. So you can see on deck A now, I'm bringing up the new track. And I can still create a mix to come in with. So I took the kick out there. There's the bass on there. Add a bit of reverb. So it enables me to basically mix through, sorry, not mix through, um, blend through the set like a DJ would with deck A and deck B with all of the controls of a DJM mixer pretty much. And I can also add more effects if I want to. But this is a trick I used to do actually with the crossfader on the Ox track. And the problem was that it used to be quite risky and quite contrived in the way that you used to do it using scenes and it wouldn't always work. This is just a way that works really, really well. To improve this though, I would like to have some sort of um, faders so it makes it easier to bring one in and one out or to have a crossfader so I can kind of crossfade left and right. Um, let's just go back to the live uh, mix now. So this is a remix that I've just made for Nina Indy. Um, which is coming out on Dionysian Mysteries on vinyl. I'm super excited about that one. So this is going to go into the live set as well.
So let's just stop that a second. Right, so the other thing, now we've started talking about transitioning and effects and using a DJ mixer, let's also talk about the Pirate MIDI Bridge 6. Now, I've only just used this on a surface level for navigating through the set. And also, I'm going to start looking into using these as... Um, performance macros that control the whole set so it's going to get really intense quite quickly as i start to develop this over the coming months i'm really excited about this so the idea behind these uh, i haven't set these up yet but i have tested them the idea is that i've got two macros here which can send out signals to anywhere i want because of the way that i've rooted everything it can control ableton parameters it can control any of the parameters on these machines um and what they control changes as we change the song or the pattern. These don't stay constant throughout the set. I can program them accordingly to each of the songs playing in the set. It's kind of like the Hydra synth with the macros. Each preset has its own macro settings. These have got their own macro settings. Very excited about using them. It's going to be an extra addition to using an Octatrack Crossfader. Imagine how powerful it's going to be when I've got the Crossfader, the effects over here, plus anything I'm kind of modulating. And then I've also got two sets of um, performance macros that control a myriad of different things. I can create like massive wild buildups using that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of using this is that not only can these um, foot switches, because that's what they're called, basically foot switches, they can send out mini messages, but also I can send out mini messages from um, these switches here. So if I press these down, sorry, no, they're foot switches. These are flexi ports. So you can see I've got them coming on flexi one and two. Foot switches can also send out mini messages. So when I press down a foot switch or if I hold it or if I just tap it, it'll send out different messages. The way that I wanted to set this up just on a basic level it's basic, but actually it it fixes an issue that everyone has had with electron boxes, and that is set navigation or creating set lists. It is a pain in the ass. You have to like reorganize your set on the machines, copy everything over, move stuff around, write on a piece of paper to say where everything is. Or the other option is to use Ableton as your set navigator, and that's where it just gets really boring because, again, you just go in through a set. This allows me to know exactly where I am in the set, what track it is, what BPM it is, any messages I want to put on there. Also allows me to choose the different patterns in the song. Now I'll give you a quick demonstration of this. Right now, we are on pattern nine. Now I haven't put this on here yet, but what I've done is, if you press the two knobs on the MIDI fight on the top, I can scroll through. Now the reason why I did this was so, uh, that I didn't have to use the foot switches like that to go through, which is a bit annoying. So you can see I can quickly scroll through my set, and obviously I haven't populated this yet. Let's say I want to play Son 1, which is called Back It Up, and I want to go straight into the intro. What I do, hit yes to arm track 8. In fact, let's just take some stuff out first. Let's hit it again. I'm not sure if that's created a... Ah, uh, yeah, I've not set this up. So let's let's just skip that on this because I've not set up track eight yet as a recorder. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump straight into it, right? So just put them back on. Right, so let's say I want to go to um, intro of this track. All I'll do is just press that, see it lights up, and then on time, everything will change. So basically, it's quite simple. I'm sending a program change message out, but also I've labeled them and I've color coded them. Let's say if I want to go to the main kind of riff, which brings in the Typhon as well. So let's create a little bit of a transition buildup. And now we're on to the main part of the song. Yeah, we're in that now. Let's say we want to go to the break now. Add a bit of high pass.
So yeah, I can navigate around like that. Um, I haven't put this extra one in here, but when I go to pattern five, which is also part of the song, that's the bit where it gets to fuck it up. So if I go to that. So that changes the preset on the Typhon. Also changes the distortion settings for the Digitats and the Syntax, so you can hear the, ch the sound has kind of changed. And you can hear the way that the distortion really interacts with everything. Uh, the other thing that I want to quickly talk about is the synth. So on channel 9 and channel 10, you can see that I can, or should be able to, let me just have a quick look. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I've got the feedback coming on there, and I'm going to fix that using a gate, Ableton's gate later on. But you can see I'm able to play this synth. If I go to track 9, I can play... Typhon. And don't forget, I can change the CC messages from the Digitats as well. Um, the third one is the Hydrosynth, which is not coming through yet because I have not... There we go. Set it up. You can hear it coming through there. There's still a lot of work that I need to do, but I kind of know exactly what I need to program next. Um, so yeah, they're the synths that we've got going on. There's also options to obviously run Ableton synths as well because I can run like Wavetable and stuff and trigger that from the Digitats or the Syntax or even the Ops track as well. Although I don't like using the USB because it kind of crashes it sometimes. Um, what we're going to do over the coming weeks is talk about exactly how I've routed the audio, how I've routed the MIDI, what channels the MIDI's on, how program change is working, um, how to program the Pirate MIDI Bridge 6, how um, I'm able to control other synths using the Digitax. We'll go deeper into sound design as well and how I actually put a track together using these machines and the hybrid setup. Um, and we'll just kind of develop it as I go because there's so much more that I've got in my head that I need to program and develop. Um, but I'm really excited about this. Like I said, I've battle tested a lot of it and it works so, so well. So let's maybe just finish off by covering a few extra bits that I've kind of missed out. I mean, there's there's absolutely loads of stuff that I've not covered here. Um, the PC uh, 4, that is going to be, I think anyway, I think this is going to be syntax individual track duties. So I've done videos on that before, how sets of twos can be performance macros for the 12 tracks. That's quite handy. You know, if I've got a synthesizer on track 4, track 5, and I want to be able to modulate some parameters by hand, then I've got that available there. The way that the um, PC4 and the Bridge 6 is rooted, it means that the MIDI from these can kind of reach almost every aspect of the live set. So I um, will obviously adapt that as time goes on. Same with the MIDI Fighter Twister. It's got the capabilities to modulate pretty much almost anything within the set um by routing and rerouting stuff in and out so we'll cover that in more detail i've also got extra pages so i did set up an extra page here so you can see i've left the buttons open on the the right hand side and i can go through the four pages like that so on page two i've set up another send which goes to ableton's spectral resonator um and the reason why i put it on a return which i don't actually really like that much putting it on a return because you've got a lot of latency you can see there we've got 34.8 milliseconds of latency um, which w is the reason why it can't be on a track and we'll go into audio and midi latency in the coming episodes because um it's a big massive thing with doing something like this is that you are going to create sample latency you can see here though if i look at the bottom left hand side when i over over the elements within a track you can see it's not adding any latency because of the way that i've set up these um these plugins so obviously with um with standard clip you can see i'm not using any over sampling which doesn't sound as good obviously you know there's probably producers out there that are like oh you've got to use some over sampling if i use over sampling i'm going to bring in some um latency so i'm quite happy with being able to use this in a doorless ish rig because it means i can get my sound like absolutely spanking 
Like this, <laughs> this set's never been this loud, um, or powerful or distorted. Um, let me just grab this box. So I'm still in two minds about whether I'm going to be using... It's so dusty, I haven't used it in, in a month. Um, I'm still in two minds whether this is going to come back into the set because there is an option, obviously, to um, take the master out and put it in here, send it to front of house and just add a little bit of that auto boom warmth and compression. Um, I'm going to test it. It might be overkill. I might just use it for live sets and then I will finally conquer... DJs. I will maybe be even be louder and dirty and filthier than DJs, which is good. That's always been the goal. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy that I've been able to kind of achieve a studio quality sound um, without having to go completely in the box. Like I still feel like this is a dollar set. When I play live, the laptop screen will be off and out of the way because everything is already pre-programmed and all of the messages are coming from the machines going into Ableton anyway. Let's just quickly talk about Ableton as well because the way that I'm running this as well is I'm not actually firing anything from Ableton. It's all kind of getting worked on the machines. Ableton is an audio processor. Even though you can see on the top left there, I am syncing Ableton to one of the boxes. I think it might be the Digitact. Let me just have a quick look. See what I mean? There's so much to go through and we can't do it all in one session. So I'm going to do it in individual videos. Probably going to be the longest course I've ever made and a free one as well. Um, Electron Digitax, yeah. So I'm syncing it from there. And that is just for the main reason of being able to sync plugins like the delay. If I press this on the um, MIDI fight twist there, you can see I can switch from timed to sync. And it just means that when I change these, they are actually in sync with 140 BPM, which is what I'm running at. The problem with this is that's not actually in sync. It's just telling this to change the delay to 140 BPM. Because if I try and sync stuff like audio, it's just going to be all out. And I've tried using a few different clock devices and I'm just not quite happy and content with that. I used to use Os Usamo by Expect Sleepers and that used to do the trick. But I tested in another box recently and I just want having it. I was like, this is how I'm going to do it because I love the steadiness of Dollars. But I'm going to use Ableton as the processor. Um, and all of the, the MIDI automations are not going to be inside Ableton. They're also going to come from the boxes. That was the other goal that I set out to do, and I've achieved that. Um, and also, I didn't want to lug around a massive DJM, so I've created a DJM mixer within Ableton, and I have still can add more to this and make it more interesting. Um, and we'll do this in a session as well. I'll show you how I've made a like-for-like -like, um, DJ mixer with all of the correct EQs, um, all at the same shapes that they should be and how I've managed to use Smart Excel to create this here with the right curves and the on off and stuff like that. So we'll talk about all of that in upcoming episodes. Um, the other thing I wanted to just quickly talk about, was there anything else? Yeah, we've got other stuff going on as well, like sidechain. So in a doorless world, I would obviously have to buy something like the pill pedal or create some pseudo side chain on the boxes. But I love just basically rooting a kick to a compressor. And you can see, let me just turn this down. You can see what I'm doing there is um, using the EQ search, so listen to the low end, side chain it from drums A and B. And then it means all my sims get kind of pushed down. And don't forget these settings don't have to stay consistent like this because they get saved when i stash a preset on here so as i was saying before if i um stash so if we go to the twister and i stash and then i change these settings but then i press recall you can see it flicks straight back it's it's amazing absolutely amazing this max for live device if it wasn't for this device and the new update i probably wouldn't have gone hybrid um so there's a lot to be said to the new update and that's the reason why i've decided to give Ableton another go at being my live assistant. Um, that's pretty much it for now. I think I'm going to leave it there because there's a lot to go through. Um, this has already been turned into quite a long video. And what I'll do now is I'll start to break it down over the coming days, weeks, and months. So, yep, yeah, that is me done for today. And I will see you soon.